So, in the original work, uh, published uh, Structure Magic Volume 1, where the Metal Model occurred, appeared for the first time officially, uh, Ben and I called it modal operators. We borrow this term. There are three levels of logic that you, uh, you can, are typically going to confront when you take a university level or even high school level course uh, in logic. There's the, uh, if A is true and B is true, what is the truth value of A and B? So that's the most basic propositional logic. And then you get quantification. Um, all uh, humans are mortal. Uh, Simon's a, a, a <coughs> human, Simon's mortal. So the propositional calculus. Uh, and then the, the quantification sum all blah, blah, blah. And finally, the third level is modal operators. And that's what we're doing here, the must, can, can't, must, uh, have to, etc. Now, that's sort of the background where the name comes from. And if you're interested, it gives you a, a string to pull to go back in and see what they've actually done in formalizing what we're trying to do here. In terms of its application and its, uh, and its use in a meta model, it's primarily a way of identifying the edge of somebody's thinking. If, in fact, the verbal productions that people make are a reasonably faithful reflection of the thinking patterns in all systems, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, etc., as well as verbal, then you've been treated to a gift. They've just told you where the edge of their map is. What are the challenges if I say to you, we can't do this? What are the challenges? How do you challenge that? And you need to explain that now. Yes, but what specific verbal challenge will you make to a statement? In other words, like, we can't do that. We can't do the program you just done. I'll show you. Okay. There's actually two challenges. One points to the future, and one points to the past. So if I say we can't do this, and you say what stops us, you ask what is the impediment, what is the obstacle, what is it in the world, that makes it impossible or we can't do this particular thing. So you're asking for sort of what is the obstacle, which is really a past, present-oriented question. The other one is more interesting. What would happen if we did? And that's gold. In business, in research, in management practice, in family, um, you know, it'll take... <laughs> It'll take a little extra time with your teenagers, but they should be taught this. You can't go to the dance. Mom, what would happen if I did? <laughs> there may be a hell of a good answer to that, and there may not. But it will, it will teach the child, as they move into other parts of their life, to identify intuitively these sort of conversational hinders, and to push past it and explore the consequences of doing things that are claimed you can't do. So, I can't do X, what would happen if you did? I must do X, what would happen if you didn't? So it's the same challenge. It's, there's just a flip in the affirmative negation uh, parts of it. So is that part clear? Is that challenge clear? And to me, that of the challenges that you can make, this is the most profitable. The boss says, yeah, great idea, but we can implement that. Boss, excuse me, respectfully, help me understand. What would happen if we did? And now you've opened the conversation. You're doing a research project. I can't get the results that I'm attempting to get. Well, what would happen if you did? Or in that case, it's quite useful to ask, what specifically stops you? What's the impediment? So the future-oriented question, which I, I endorse unequivocally, is what would happen if you did? What would happen if you didn't, depending on whether it's a camp or a must? And the one that explores the present obstacles to doing that, and the past ones, is what stops you from doing that? What makes you do that? Depending on whether it's a have to must or unable can't. So if somebody says, you know, we have to do this, and you go, um, or we can't do this, and somebody, and you respond with, uh, what stops you? What stops us? There is an implication that there's a cause-effect relationship between the thing you're proposing and the present obstacles in the world. And I don't like much endorsing any cause-effect in human discourse. So I, I am very sympathetic to, to Bo's proposal here. 
Uh, and that's why I'm endorsing the future question, what would happen if we did do it, what would happen if we didn't do the thing that we uh, must or can't, etc. Because sometimes if you ask what prevents you, it could actually take you into unresourced or it often does. And notice, you know, this, there's always mom's voice going, um, why can't you clean up your, your room before you leave in the morning? And so often such things lead to, as you correctly say, states of ineptitude. Essentially, you move to justifying the thing that you can't do as opposed to exploring the consequences of what would happen if you did do that. And consequence of exploration is, is what I want to endorse here. Not the investigation of what stops you because of the implications, as Will points out, but the cost effect that's implicit in the question. Well, that's a good well, question. What would happen if you did take time? I mean, that's well, like. But I don't have time in this. It's you of trying to question. You never have time? What if you substitute reading a book for this ridiculous conversation we're having right now? So there's always that relativizing to the immediate experience move, which I endorsed. I have to actually get her out of that, so I don't, I don't have to. Well, she's, like a lot. she's yeah. living in second position. She's living at the service of the needs of other people. There's no first position well developed. Otherwise, this would not be an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the issue actually runs deeper. It was the conversation we were talking about earlier this morning about people who don't have a first position and how do you develop it. But it's not a bad beginning to go, well, you don't have, you, you can't do it because you don't have time, you always are busy. Always, you never sleep, you never stop, you find yourself, you, you can explore that issue. Uh, what would happen if you did take the time and reduce the commitment to these other activities, and spread it out over a month, you know, lots of ways to negotiate it. But underneath, I think you're going to uncover the lack of a well-developed first position. She is a female. She doesn't know what she wants. I mean, my mom was a complete exception. She was, <laughs> she was her own person. Uh, but in her generation, women in the States were sort of evaluated on knowing what the needs of their children and husbands were before they knew what their needs were. And the only way you can accomplish that is by living in their, in their position. So you sense, calibrate, second position, and you're empty. And that's why the empty nest syndrome is so strong in that generation. Once the children are gone, suddenly you're confronted with this person who, you know, your husband and wife, depending on how it goes. Um, and, you know, it's empty. There's nothing to be done. And now suddenly you're confronted with the boy. What am I going to do with my life? Often, it results in some cases in so-called midlife crises, where they try to fill the, the void with things, material things. How did you develop the first position? I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been here. I've always known what I want. That helps immensely. And it sort of presupposes the first position. I can sense what I want. If you ever get a chance to watch Carmen Bosick at a, a buffet, it's very instructive. Um, she'll walk through the buffet, <laughs> sniffing, looking, pausing, she won't take nothing. And then, assuming she has time to do it. Then she'll go back and she'll get a plate. And she'll walk up and stand in front of this offering, waiting for a movement or a lack of movement. So she lets her unconscious pick the portions and the sequences and the combinations uh, which are healthiest as far as the human body can. Now, there's a lot of other things to be said about eating and weight management and so forth. Um, we're very corrupted by sugar and, and refined flour and so forth in most of the Western European or Western European derivative cultures. But there's an old experiment that happened in the late 30s, I think. Take an infant, a year and a half, who can more or less feed themselves, and give them what, at the time, uh, of, in this era, were considered the major food groups, which in some proportionality were considered to be a, a perfect diet. Uh, it's changed, revealing the ignorance behind each one of our attempts to make this happen. But nevertheless, if you give the kid, let the kid feed itself, and cover the floor around it, you know, and 
<laughs> then you weigh the containers and you keep track of how much of each one of these made you food. Over any single feeding, over any single day, over any single series of four or five days, horribly unbalanced diet. Over about a week or ten days, it starts to close you know, on average. And this is sometimes referred to as the wisdom of the body. Notice I use a, a year and a half old baby as the model here because they are less corrupted by the things that I just mentioned, sugar, and refined flour, and so forth. Uh, so there's something very nice about having enough self-calibration or sensitivity to what you need in your body that you seek certain things automatically. And if you have access to those sensations, then you can allow them to unfold rather than overriding them with more conscious decisions about I want something sweet or 